Hello, Seasteaders. Welcome back to the Seasteading Today podcast. We are going to do something a little different this time. For the past couple years, we have been hosting monthly seasteading social events where we invite a guest speaker to give a presentation and then answer questions from participants. We have moved those events to Discord and are now releasing the recordings as podcast episodes. Here is the first episode catching up with Arctide recorded in January of 2023. If you would like to attend a Seasteading Social, find the next event at seasteading.org slash events. Enjoy. All right. Welcome, everyone, to our conversation catching up with Arctide. Um, we have Ben Saloni, CEO of Arctide, who we last talked to during our uh, podcast episode for Seasteading Today podcast. And that was about a year ago. So, Ben, um, tell us. What has been happening with Arctide in the past year? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me here. And uh, a ton has happened, of course. Um, and uh, uh, and keeping some updates, but I'll, I'll give a brief overview uh, for those who haven't seen in, in this quarter or social media. But um, yeah. So we uh, I, really a lot of it, especially, has happened in the in the. Um, I don't know, past four months, probably. Uh, I'm now in Puerto Rico right now um, at one of the uh, homes. We have a, a place with uh, uh, multiple units so that we're sort of preparing for people to be able to come down and visit uh, when we start building. And uh, we have a construction site that's at a cement uh, factory here and uh, access to the water off the west coast of Puerto Rico. And um uh, just brought on a construction manager to begin construction in the next few weeks. So um, we we started in, I guess going back a bit, we, I, I moved from Virginia to Florida to start trying to do stuff there. We looked all over the place, um, maybe Honduras and Texas. Um, we were working with Mitchell uh, in the Philippines and, um, and uh, now have landed and finally settled in Puerto Rico as a starting point. But um, do you want to tell us more about what uh, criteria you're looking for in those different locations and how Puerto Rico meets the criteria? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, obviously the water access um, and uh, that's pretty easy to come by. Water access that is protected, uh, equatorial, something like that. Obviously, we don't want to put a prototype out in the middle of a hurricane uh, zone. Uh, so that limits our options a bit. And then just... Um, uh, flexibility, I guess, as far as where we're at, like, uh, I moved down by Tampa Bay and the Bay in particular is, uh, a lot more regulated and patrolled and controlled, I guess, um, than even the Gulf would be. So, um, so just looking for a place that has a lot of water area, a lot of, uh, a lot of space and, um, isn't going to be excessively, uh, uh regula- regulated, uh, as far as doing things in the water. Uh, including for things like aquaculture and energy generation and all those different things. So uh, Puerto Rico um, is awesome because it's you can get here with a driver's license. You don't even need a passport. Uh, most people speak English. Uh, lots of stuff is in, in English um, dollars, of course. It's a really easy uh, place to hop on a plane and get down here. And then um, and then the, the other thing that we very quickly found out uh, in coming down here, which we didn't even really know, I didn't anyway uh is there are lots and lots and lots of incentives uh, to bring foreign investment uh which would include states from the states uh or maybe especially from the states to do uh manufacturing and to create jobs and things like that uh one example being if you uh are setting up a manufacturing facility then the puerto rican government will basically give you tax credits worth uh, about 30 to 40 percent of the value of that including the cost to ship it so if you need a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment you might get 30 or forty thousand back in tax credits which you can then sell on a tax credit market here um there's tons of incentives for uh we're also partnering with the university of puerto rico and there are a lot of incentives for working with interns and uh hiring locally and um so it's just it's just been a very very welcoming environment uh we found so far as far as doing any kind of business here but uh in particular what we're doing uh we've found more support here than anywhere else so um but i have a couple questions in the arctide chat uh do you have a specific location within puerto rico from suzanne 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I am, uh, I am currently about 30 minutes inland from Maya Huez, which is on the Western central, uh, as far as North South goes, it's in the center and it's on the, the Western coast. Um, and actually I was going to post some pictures as I talked, I forgot here. Um, <laughs> Just so y'all can know, this is first one is where I'm actually at right now, um, which is a little more up in the mountains. Um, and oh, and I'll also oh no, my file's too big. There I'll, I'll uh, spell it in here as well because people might not know. All right, so Maya Juez, uh, Puerto Rico, um, and the Western Coast. Uh, as far as waters go, I guess I'll talk about that a bit too. Uh, the north side of Puerto Rico actually has some of the best surfing uh, in any U.S. area, I guess, um, in that it competes with uh, uh, Hawaii for the best surfing. So they get really fantastic waves up there. Um, but at the same time, on the west coast and on the south, it's... Uh, protected uh, from those waves, which come from the north. And so it's very, very calm waters. Um, and so in particular here at Mai Huez, there's a bay, uh, and the waves are extremely calm. Um, it also protects against hurricanes, which typically come from the south, east, and across the island. And the issue they have with hurricanes down here primarily is heavy rainfall, uh, more so, far more so than the wave height. Um, so we looked at the buoy data for buoys all around Puerto Rico, and it's significantly lower than what we have around Fort, uh, Florida. So, so hurricanes are not a uh, an absolute deterrent against building seasteads. Yeah, it's just uh, uh, when you when you look through hurricane maps, uh, and um, you know, I will try to share one later. I've got a good one of historic hurricanes. Uh, hurricanes when they hit Puerto Rico are, are generally a cap category one. Uh, and they, again, typically the issue here, because it's so mountainous, people live in the mountains, power lines, roads, all those sorts of things, uh, they get a lot of rain, uh, but the hurricane itself is moving fairly slow, which is part of why they get so much rain, but they don't get nearly as high of winds. Uh, and again, the wave heights are about the max wave heights are about half of what they are up in the Gulf off of Florida. So, um, yeah, so like just in general, as far as hurricanes go, uh, now I wouldn't really go much further north than this probably. Um, but it's just, if you say there's hurricanes here, not all hurricanes are equal, I guess, in strength, uh, depending on where you are, because you could be on the north, northern end of the equator, you might get a hurricane, but you're getting really just the edge of it and it's, it's barely doing anything. So it, the category of it, uh, makes a huge difference. And I think um, your the the structural design of your uh, seastead platform has changed a lot since we last talked. So, do you want to talk a little bit about the evolution of, of the design you're working with? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we've been all over the place in the past year. Uh, I think even when we did that interview, we changed the design significantly from when, <laughs> when we first talked to you about doing the interview to when we did the interview, like. Uh, two months later or something. So uh, we started with, uh, well, we, I don't even know what our first one was anymore. But um, so we've run through, I don't know, probably hundreds of wave simulations at this point. Um, uh, and we, you know, our initial goal, of course, we came into this with saying we do not want to design a, a billion dollar idea and then go out and try to raise a billion dollars because that never works. Um, so we started from the beginning wanting to scale down as much as possible, um, something that people could afford, something we could easily prototype. Uh, and so, so we brought that down to these incredibly small structures. Um, but what we started finding was that we were using uh, more materials um, under the water, I guess, as far as like the spar based systems and things like that. Uh, and that, that space, those materials weren't really going to livable space. And if we just expand the uh, size of what's on top of the water, we can achieve a, a, a similar or better stability um, at a slightly bigger scale. Um, so initially our target was more like a hundred thousand dollar range. Uh, now we might be at uh, in, in that hundred thousand dollar range for a, a person or a small family. Um, 
going up to a million dollar range, for example, you can all of a sudden put 50 people on it um, or any, really anywhere from 20 to 50 pretty easily. And so the cost per unit, cost per square foot, et cetera, goes down drastically. Um, so again, we, we still are totally do not want to go in the billion dollar range, um, but scaling it up a little bit has huge positive uh, 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 I don't know, I guess potential, um, including when it comes to things like OTEC and aquaculture and things like that, that we really want to be at a little bit bigger scale. Um, and again, if we can you know, make it affordable enough that say 10 people can go in together and buy a private floating island, um, then that's pretty close to the, uh, I guess the ideal maybe of, uh, you know, every individual having their own seastead. So that's kind of where we're at right now on it. Um, but I, I guess overall design, I think I know I've said this in the Discord a lot of times. You really, for for say uh, equatorial or areas around here where you get six meter waves, you either have to go deep enough or wide enough. You go beyond the wavelength and you're stable. You go below the waves uh, for the center of gravity and you're stable. And so those materials are either going to go into a big spar that goes deep in the water and yeah, you could put windows in it and have a cool underwater viewing area, but it's not very useful overall. Um, you can't really put a lot of rooms there and space for people to live and uh, space for gardening and things like that. Um, but if you take that amount of material and you put it into something that's wide uh, out to a wavelength, and in this case, we've got, um, I'll share the designs again in here, although I know I've shared them. Uh, this one is about 250 foot diameter and uh, uh, we're working on an update that's about 328. It's a 100 meter diameter. Just so, share a few of these, but um, so yeah, overall, it's just the, the benefits of slightly leaving it up, um, which I know this looks pretty significant, but again, when you when you take all those materials of a deep spar uh, and, and spread them out, um, it creates a much bigger area on top of the water for people and uh gardening and animals whatever so so for this design uh, what do you expect the you know population to be you know what how much space is residential versus business versus green space can you tell us a little bit about that yeah yeah so overall if we do 100 and these pictures are 250 feet, which we can we can do. I like the stability of the 100 meters as we go a little bit bigger. Um, then each of those can be entirely independent. They don't need anything as far as like stability if they're out in the equator or here on the west side of Puerto Rico and, and further south from here. Um, and so with that two acres, you also get inside uh, about two acres of living space, well, actually a bit more with the multiple floors. So in this particular case, we have, uh, um, I think we have about 50 units on here um, that range from 800 square feet up to, I think, 3,000 square feet. I'm, I don't have the numbers right here, but uh, again, updating it slightly. And we're kind of looking at like Dunbar's number kind of stuff. Like, you know, if a single community can be anywhere from obviously one person with uh, with a few million dollars, several million dollars can buy this, but uh, but it it, it really maxes out if you were squishing in at 500 people uh, living on this thing, uh, which is kind of the upper end of that Dunbar's number, which is how many people you can know before you start have to uh, start having to implement some kind of governance uh, into it. And so that community, uh, again, which it might be you and 10 friends and you have, uh, you know, uh, 0.2 acres basically on the top and it, it's less like cut up than this is. Um, then that's an option where we're trying, like the goal of it is to make it extremely flexible, uh, so that you could put a resort there for, you know, 50 no terms, you could have, you know, five people go in and buy it. And then more of the top side is going to be, uh, green and trees, uh, things like that. Uh, and then people are living inside of it where you have open private patio areas and things like that. Um, as well as more industrial uses like mining and, uh, aquaculture. Great. Do you mind? If you we, wanna, oh, I yeah, wanted to ask ahead. Ben to ask if we can take some questions now about uh, the design and, and Puerto Rico for a bit, if that's okay with you, Ben. Yeah, yeah. And I see people, sorry, I see people flooding in here with questions and I don't have time to like, read them all. So 
uh, yeah, definitely ask them, and then I'll try to go through these at the end too. Go ahead. Uh, first is um, uh, somebody asked about uh, Category Five uh, hurricanes. How was the local municipality affected by that? And then next, I was very curious as to how you would interconnect these round uh, designs with one another. But uh, probably start with the mm -hmm. first one first. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so again, the, like the last hurricane, the entire island lost power. A hundred percent of people lost power. <laughs> Uh, most of that is because the the entire outside of it is beach, uh, pretty much, and the entire inside is this mountainous, hilly kind of area, and it's it's quite steep uh, hills. Even my yard here at this the, the place that we're at now uh, is is fairly steep, and so mudslides and power lines that go down every time there's these heavy rains. Um, and so those are the biggest issues. But yeah, anyway, it's it's very mountainous on the interior, uh, and they're running power lines through it, through the island, across the island, through these mountainous areas, uh, people living on the sides of these hills. And so the major problem is due to flooding and mudslides and things like that uh, as far as what's bringing down the power. It's not that the winds are so incredibly strong that they're knocking down um, you know, power lines and things like that. Obviously, it is a hurricane. There are still winds. Um, but when we go back and look at the buoy data in these waters off the south coast during a hurricane, um, it's, again, significantly less than what we see up in the Gulf uh, because those wind speeds aren't nearly as high. Um, they haven't had the time to develop that that strength, I, I guess, um, by the time they get up there. So um, most of the hurricanes go by the north side uh, or, or hit on the east and then kind of ends up north. Uh, occasionally, they'll go down south, uh, which, again, we see... Uh, much lower wave heights, which is obvious. Like we had a lot of off seas that it doesn't affect us as much. Uh, even a lot of wind, it's the wave height that we were concerned about. Yeah, am I still good? You guys hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so as far as connecting them, uh, the great thing about building larger structures is they are independently fully stable. So we don't need to. Uh, have some kind of rigid connection between them to increase stability or anything like that. We can just have bridges between them, uh, birds between them, whatever we want to have. So there's a lot of flexibility in how we connect and disconnect them uh, because we're not, we're not, uh, you know, again, we're, we're looking at stability that's like on the equator during the highest waves. We're at, uh, you know, a fraction of a, of a, of a degree of pitch. Um, have you and designed so, the resilient interconnects with these these bridges that might have underneath them network and water and power connections as well? Yeah, we could. I I, I mean, I, I like the idea of each island being independent. Again, looking at a, a two-acre island with OTEC and its own aquaculture and its own uh, waste and things like that, maybe there's an advantage to selling that information or selling the electricity to the neighboring island or sharing it or something. I to do that. Um, but I like the idea of each island being independent on its own and able to stand on its own. And all you're doing is connecting up. And that way, if you don't like your neighbors, um, if you as a community or a, a person that owns your own island or whatever, don't like your neighbors, you just disconnect and reconnect to somebody else's place or whatever. And you don't have this sort of, Oh, we have an agreement where we shared power and we shared, water and we can't just leave when we want well that would be a really dramatic breaking up scenario you know disconnecting your bridge and the network connections and everything else that would actually that's stuff for a, for yeah. a novel right there <laughs> right yeah absolutely so uh i you know i like the idea of, of more like starlink for each island each island just they obviously certainly people will import things um just because we we like stuff but ideally or, or at least it's the potential is there that every island can be self-sustaining for food, water, energy, uh, connectivity, uh, waste, et cetera. Do you fully expect to use VSAT as your primary network and internet solution? Yeah, probably. I mean, you have to go pretty tall. I, I used to do uh, long range wireless systems actually. So, uh, I mean, I can do a hundred mile point to point or something like that, but then you have a de dependency on shore of whatever, wherever you're on shore. Um, but certainly you could connect, interconnect them. If you go, I mean, you need a tower at that point at these heights, I don't know, maybe you could do 20 miles or something. Um, so you, you can act, you could create your own, 
uh, uh, I guess, micro internet sort of and things like that. Um, yeah, I was thinking you could, it, you could mesh out all your islands together with towers on each right. island. Separate yeah, discussion. yeah, absolutely. I mean, one one thing here, just on a bit of a side tangent, I don't want to we'll get back to questions, but uh, the other cool thing about OTEC is we're pumping up a lot of cold water. We're generating a lot of electricity, and we have a lot of cold water right there, which is really great for data centers and uh, crypto mining and obviously anything that uses a lot of computers. So um, uh, and Microsoft did some testing on underwater data centers uh, and found it very cost-effective. Um, so that's a thing where the internet may not be coming to Seasteads, but, Seas but, but from Seasteads, uh, because the cheapest, most efficient way to have your data centers is on a Seastead. Thank you. Um, I've invited Freeport to ask a question, but I think he stepped away. Um, so are, are there any other questions for Ben about the design? I mean, it, it looks super cool. So where are you at as far as the development process? Um, and the and the business process like you're you're building prototypes right now in puerto rico yeah so we uh i mean one of the things that uh looking for oh thanks eric k for posting that yeah that's what i was talking about that uh microsoft underwater data center um uh yeah so one of the one of the holdups for the past really few months as we've uh really narrowed down the materials we want to use the sort of the equation for building the structure since we just, you know, there, I, I don't think there's a fancy special kind of design. It's just something big and kind of hydrodynamic and such. Uh, and so the material cost and the construction are the two key factors in that equation of building a, an inexpensive structure uh, with low maintenance. And so, so we've, we've, we've kind of had that for a while. We've just been refining it um, and we've been looking for waterfront space to build a big thing. And that's proven difficult. Just the, I don't know. A lot of it is just the, the time that, you know, it takes months to get a place and refurbish it and things like that. So, so what we've started with now, uh, is at this concrete plant, we're about 15 minutes from the water and we're going to start building smaller modules, which I'll, I'll just put a picture up here. Uh, we're basically going to build our own construction platform because barges and construction ships are incredibly expensive as well. And we can build something far cheaper. Um, and this could be, it's its cool as a long-term approach as far as you can just add more blocks, basically, and build it out over time. The uh, the advantage of the domes, um, I think, significant is that they are monolicture. There are no connection points. There's no, uh, everything's just built as a seamless single structure, um, which when we're dealing with waves has a huge advantage. So in this particular case, this is, I think we ended up with about 110 foot rough diameter, uh, building it out of blocks that we can easily construct on land and trailer and take to the water and assemble in the water. Um, and it, again, we're in very calm waters in the Bay of Mayuez, so we can deal with the connection piece of it. I, I don't care for it as far as like being out in the equator and long-term people living there, but as a construction platform, um, it's going to be great, as well as obviously it'll be a prototype in and of itself as far as testing our materials and our construction methods and we refine all of that. And then from this platform, we'll build the larger domes. So our, our, with our current setup, which again, a, a lot of this has happened, especially in the past few weeks, uh, as we've nailed down, uh, housing and construction facility and equipment and, uh, what's locally available. We do have to import a couple things, which will take about two weeks. Um, and that's kind of our biggest delay right now. The, the facility has materials testing equipment. Um, so we'll be doing our own testing there. Uh, and then once we get that stuff in, in, in two weeks, uh, we will be running through some more for another couple of weeks before we actually build the first block, uh, and put it in the water. So it's our, our timeline right now to get something actually in the water. And then we just continue building those. Uh, probably more efficiently as we go, uh, we make minor tweaks and connect them together into a platform, which will take a few months probably once we get up to speed. Um, oh, just as far as the question here, I'm just looking at it real quick. It's 12 miles is uh, the 
territorial waters typically, and then 200 miles is e EEZ, exclusive economic zone. Uh, what's interesting here, and one thing I like about the Caribbean is far before 200 miles, I can't remember, 30 miles maybe, 40 miles, we hit uh, Dominican Republic waters. And when we go south, we hit uh, Virgin Islands, British Virgin Islands, and what else is down there? Somebody else could probably look, St. Thomas maybe. Um, so you, it, throughout the Caribbean, you have all these points where there's four different national waters that all come together a few miles off their coast or, or a few tens of miles off their coast, um, which is a unique situation where you can move your seastead to whoever's waters you want and sort of uh, compete, I suppose, for your uh, your seastead being in their waters. So. Um, so Ben, I think that there's some, uh, well, I want to make sure that all of your, all of the points that you wanted to share on the call today, you have a chance to share them. So um, tell us a little bit about some of your long-term visions for seasteading. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll throw a few pictures in here. Some of these are AI art, but, um, uh, but yeah, so the, the, long thing uh that gets really interesting and something i've been fleshing out recently is looking at let's say the next 100 years uh, for humanity and where we will likely inhabit is basically land water air space and other planets or ovens uh whatever those all fall into and so uh so looking at those things I I, I was looking at the um, what was available in the water beneath your home, basically. So comparing if you buy an acre of land anywhere in the world, or let's say you could float in the sky, or you live on a space station, or you live on Mars, or the ocean, uh, what you have is not only your acre of land, but you have uh, an enormous amount of water beneath you. Uh, it's not just square feet, it's cubic feet at that point. And from that, you have this massive amount of energy uh, that comes from the sun and is stored thermally in seawater, as well as uh, the motion of currents and waves. There's an enormous, and, and not even counting that you're sitting on a bed of hydrogen, but <laughs> uh, there's an enormous amount of energy potential there. Uh, and, and the water, which you can easily desalinate, uh, an enormous amount of food potential. Um, and then the key thing that you can't really get anywhere else is basically every mineral uh on earth is floating around in seawater and so I, I actually just i looked up one of the numbers just out of curiosity uh it's kind of an obvious one i think or it's been studied for centuries is gold uh we found 187,000 tons of gold there's about 57,000 tons that we know of that's remaining uh and yet in the oceans we estimate there's about 20 million tons <laughs> and so when you combine the fact that you're already pumping water through with OTEC, uh, and then you're able to, uh, as technology grows, that we're able to get those uh, materials out of the water, and then 3D printing improves, then all of a sudden, you know, what happens when everybody on Earth could live on a seastead and have unlimited access to everything? You just, if you want a golden, the solid gold toilet seat, you can 3D print one. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you want a new pair of shoes, you just 3D print one. Uh, you have access to everything. And you can't really get that in any other living situation except on the ocean. You, you can't really, nowhere on Earth that I know of anyway, on land, can you have some kind of autonomous method of mining everything that you might ever need. That, so, um, that sounds like a, walking. that's great. I mean, the, the marketing campaign writes itself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, at, at a certain point um, there, it doesn't, you know, I, it, it just doesn't make sense to live on land. For example, and Mars obviously is kind of cool. Space is kind of cool, but like uh, if that's your thing of what, like come here, you get the land and actually even to the extent that you can just grow more, or less, but that's not really possible anywhere else. So if you decide your two, your your acre is too small and you want to add another acre, all the minerals to build that acre are floating in the water below you. Um, so as we begin to automate these processes and and be out uh, things, I, I will play a big part in that as well as robotics. Um, then that is how I envision the future of the world. Um, and even to the extent that uh, I'll throw this is an AI art. Um, we're working on a, a actual render, but. SpaceX is building uh, refurbishing floating oil platforms to be spaceports. Um, there's something called a space gun, or 
solar space cannon where uh, you're floating this like thousand meter long uh, cannon in the water and blasting uh, not people because they would die, but um, uh, but satellites and materials up into space. And so really our, our I think our future of uh, space exploration and living in space is dependent on us getting into the oceans. Um, for, for in the particular case of Starship, which is launching soon, uh, we can use OTEC to generate electricity to get hydrogen out of seawater, which we can convert to methane, which is what Starship runs off of. So you can potentially have a, a spaceport floating in the ocean that after your upfront cost, you have free rocket fuel. So, um, so I'm, I don't know, I, <laughs> I kind of see this as core to everything about the future of humanity in the world. Uh, and not only that, um, sorry, stop me if I'm going too long, but um, the thing is, if you, uh, the, the thing about being out, let's say, in the equator in the middle of the ocean is it's virtually a desert. It's it's deemed a desert because it's it's mostly lifeless, aside from whales passing through and things like that. Um, there's no where for a fish habitat because it's too deep, and there isn't enough mineral content for a lot of things to thrive. And so, rather than taking your acre in pristine forest where you cut everything down and chase away all the animals and dig up all the dirt and everything uh, to live there. Uh, the middle of the ocean is actually more like going to the Sahara and uh, which obviously if you go to the Sahara, you're not instantly going to create life. But if you do, uh, all of a sudden you create uh, fish habitats and uh, whole ecosystems that are on these floating structures. And when you pump up that water with OTEC, you're pumping up all this mineral rich uh nutrient rich water that fish thrive on. And so, uh, so you're, you're going into the most, uh, lifeless parts of the world and you are allowing life to flourish there, which benefits the people living on the Island and everything under the Island. So I get really excited about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, sorry. I think, sorry what's going on, but no, that's, um, that's such a, that's something that I think I, I need to repeat more often about, you know, bringing seasteads out to the middle of the ocean, we're, we're bringing opportunities for life to flourish. And uh, I, that's, it's really exciting. And it's not destructive like it would be, um, you know, in the desert here in the United States. You'd have to, br- you have to bring water in and that can be very environmentally destructive. But when you go out to the ocean desert and, and build, you're creating opportunity for life and not as destructive. I mean, there are certain things that we'd have to look into, I think, to make sure that we're not disrupting the environment. But I, I, I think overall, everything I learned about seasteads and what they can do in the deep ocean, it's it's an improvement. It's eco-restorative, or at least the folks that, that we want to support at the Seasteading Institute are building in a way that is eco-restorative. I did want to draw attention. So Freeport did ask his question in the chat. Um, his question was about rogue waves um, because looking at the design, it's close to the surface and has a lot of open space up top. So how do you anticipate mm-hmm. that <laughs> dealing with rogue waves? Yeah. Yeah. We've, uh, we have a, um, a blog post uh, that where we mapped out a lot of that um, like hurricane areas and rogue waves and water temperatures and things like that. Uh, if you search Arctide, uh, where can I live? I think it is. We did the two part on it if somebody could post it, but, um, road waves tend to happen where hurricanes happen, um, especially in the North sea and places like that, that are regularly getting hit by big waves. So, um, so even road waves are not a, like you have calm seas and then all of a sudden a hundred foot wave comes out of nowhere. Um, that movie was it Poseidon or something <laughs> cruise ship movie like that, uh, where a wave just came out of nowhere. It's uh, significantly higher than all the other waves around it, but it's not magically like 50 foot or 50 times more than <laughs> every other wave or something. Uh, so I think it's a bit blown out of proportion um, as far as the same for piracy, honestly. Um, I'm going to bring that up, but uh, things like that 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 do occur, um, but they are A, they're, they're very rare, and B, um, I don't know that a ship has ever been sunk by one uh, that we're aware of or at least not in modern times. Um, so, so I'm not overly concerned by it. Um, we haven't seen any data on equatorial buoys that um, supports that there are uh, rogue waves there. Um, again, the, the, the highest I've seen is five meters, slightly over five meters. Um, so, um, and I think 
for example, where we are in Puerto Rico, uh, with the way that waves, waves that come in, I really don't think it's possible for a uh, rogue wave to come into that area because it's it's such a protected area by um, the different islands that are around here. So, but it's certainly something. I mean, every every seastead, I want to have uh, you know be pulling in wave data from it or allowing the people on that island to share with it fully. Uh, because we, we certainly want to gather more information as we go. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, so some of these, like the rogue wave map here, um, obviously there are certain shipping routes where there's far more traffic and we see a bit up north, um, but we have some major shipping routes through like Pacific um, where we only see one uh, accident that's ever been caused. And then in the South Atlantic, there's one until you go really far south, which is colder than where I want to be. So, uh, and if you go out in the Indian Ocean, um, again, there's a lot of traffic going through here. So, could it happen? I mean, could a could a meteor fall out of the sky and sink a seastead? Yeah, um, but I think some of them. Uh, I don't even know if we have one up on piracy. Uh, people were just chatting about that the other day, but it's a thing where it's like, I don't know whatever it is, it's in the dozens of incidents around the world. Like I, I would feel far safer uh, out in the ocean with any risk than living in most places on land. So um, hopefully mm -hmm. that answers it. Now, Ben, as far as like developing the company in Puerto Rico, are you looking for help? Are you hiring? Are you looking for investors? What's the status there? What, what do you need from the seasteading community? Yeah. Uh, yeah, great. Um, so uh, one thing that we've talked about doing as we start building this is, uh, well, there's a couple things. So we have a, a project manager here, construction manager, uh, who will handle the on-site stuff. We have, uh, we, we for the construction, we want to we certainly want to hire a lot of Puerto Ricans. Um, but I, I would certainly love to hear from anyone who has experience with concretes, geopolymers, uh, and uh, finishing out those types of materials. Uh, formworks, uh, maybe mechanical equipment that's supporting it, things like that. Again, we do have multiple units here uh, at our property where we're living. And so I, I'm living here part time. I don't want to confuse that. I'm, <laughs> I'm in Florida full time. Uh, I have five kids. So it would be a bit of a, a move. But um, uh, so I'm interested in those sorts of things. And then as we get building, we really want to do a lot of documenting of what we're doing. Um, and it, again, especially a lot of the first things as we're partnering with the university, we're going to have a big focus on uh, environmental uh, restoration in the areas, which a lot of coral reefs here and the rest of the world have died off or are in a bad, bad state. Um, there's been overfishing, uh, which is true for most of the world, uh, things like that. So, um, so we want to uh, get a lot of that on video. We've talked about documentaries. We've talked about reality TV kind of things, uh, people living there. Um, so that whole end of it is one thing. And then, and then part of that is just people living on the first seastead. First, uh, first thing is somebody living on a boat that's tied up to the first blocks that we put in or is nearby to keep an eye on them. Um, and then once we get enough there, to get a bit of stability, then they'll gradually start living on the first um, of our sea beds there, uh, which again will be partly construction platform. So I'm not going to say it's a, a luxury resort um, to start, but um, but anyway, if that's you, and again, we'll need to chat because uh, I'm looking for people that ideally could be there and also um, be good in front of a camera. So um, I think those are those are probably our main. Uh, main things right now that we're looking for. Um, are there docking oh, facilities, one, one. Are there docking facilities okay. under each of these uh, units? I'm, I'm trying to figure out where, if you have a personal unit do you, and you have a personal boat, is there somewhere to dock it? Uh, as far as the, the platform that we're going to build starting in a few weeks here? Yes. Yeah, that the, the 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 modules for that will be assembled together into a larger construction platform. So the design for that is not to have like personal units or something like that. We'll have space inside some of them. Some will be there purely as for flotation. Um, and we will we we do want to make them large enough to be livable. But uh, again, it's not going to be the goal is not to make like a, a habitable. Uh, you know, full-time people living there, um, 
like they would for the larger structures that we're going to be building off of it. The primary goal is to have material storage and equipment there and be able to have a crew and things like that. And then in addition to that, I think we'll, we'll create a space for some people to come out. All right. Thank you. But yeah, as, as we get larger, uh, that is a good point though, because as we get larger, um, we've talked a lot about, uh, I don't have an image right now. I'll try to share it later. Uh, but basically when we have enough of these dome type structures, which depending on where you're at, where we are here about three or four, maybe five would work, uh, is to uh, group them together in a C shape, crescent shape line, depending on where the waves are coming from and create a natural harbor. So, um, so then we, from that, you can use traditional docks or whatever, but the structures themselves are large enough to act as the wave break, uh, which we've talked about the, the wave breaks a ton. And again, that's a use of materials that doesn't go into living space. So trying to maximize the amount of living space per material quantity used. Um, so if the islands themselves provide the wave break, and then we can create a safe harbor for boats. Uh, then you can use traditional floating or things like that uh, once you're in that situation. Uh, going back to the future thing, um, roughly, uh, we would need about, right now we would need about 2% of our, of the thermal energy stored in the ocean to power the world, everything. Um, and so as our population grows, whatever it peaks to, which it'll peak at some point, um, we're really only looking at like percent of the ocean as far as food, water, energy, minerals, all these things. And when we compare that to the amount of land that we need, uh, even just in agriculture, <laughs> uh, which is enormous, and uh, and the runoff from that ends up killing off lots of stuff in the ocean. Um, like obviously, yes, we we want to be very very careful about uh, existing ecosystems and uh, and nature. Um, but there's a you know the, the the comparison, I guess, to the destructive uh, farming that we're doing now uh, compared to what we can do out in the ocean off of just a few percent. Uh, of existing basically deserts um like that's the comparison that we need to make i guess when we're analyzing it uh so i'm gonna throw that out all right um yeah any more questions you can request to speak um bitsy mike's sharing some good details in the chat about um concrete and building materials but i don't think that we need to get into that here um it's it's pretty exciting. Uh, I think in the next year or so, seasteaders could go to uh, the Philippines or Puerto Rico or Panama, and you know have real. We have three real options at least of of where seasteaders could go to actually start living on seasteads. It's an exciting time for all of us. Well, if we don't have any more questions, and Ben, you don't have anything more Absolutely. to share, we can we can wrap it up. I wanted to say one more thing. Yep. Let me know if you're interested in Puerto Rico in general. There's uh, quite a large cryptocurrency uh, communities that have developed here. Uh, lots of off-grid, lots of uh, uh, lots of reasons that people have come from the States and, uh, and Puerto Ricans that are here. But some of the advantages, there's huge tax advantages for uh, cryptocurrency, for investors, people with like dividends and investment returns and things like that. Um, and in, in some cases, including com being completely tax free. So, um, let me know if you have questions. I'm kind of digging into that end of things, um, as I'm probably will be gradually moving here a bit, but, um, but anyway, yeah, ask me those on the side. Suzanne, you want to ask a Emily. question? Okay. So this is Suzanne. I'm new. Um, I mean, new to discord. I was going to say, I have a question about, um, actual human resources as far as who we're going to have living and or visiting the seasteads because you know you always want to make sure you have a really solid foundation of long-term stewards right over these seasteads you want a lot of continuity and um you know a stable stewardship over them but you obviously in order for the the whole cause to grow you need to have people filtering through. So what percentage of the, the seastead um, living capacity do you anticipate being for long-term stewards versus people coming through and educating themselves and, and trying it out, that type of thing? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think 
part of what we want to do is make these extremely flexible. Um, so I can see a lot of scenarios, um, one of which is more of a company town in that it's built around aquaculture or mining or even tourism where the, the first permanent residents are supporting that business uh, or even space uh, as we look at that option. But um, and so there's a lot of a lot of businesses that could use an entire island and then provide employee housing uh, as company towns used to do from for mining and things like that. Um, so I could see that potentially happening. Uh, again, I, I, my goal with these is to make it so as few as 10 people could get together, uh, which I personally know tons of people who either have done that or want to do that with like a homestead or a little farm or something like that. They'll go in together and buy 50 acres or 30 acres or whatever it is. Um, so I could see that as a scenario that, that could start off as, as well. Um, where we are here, there's, uh, I mean, people constantly go out uh, or whatever to uh, scuba dive around the coral reefs, um, island, little island areas that are habitable. But if you put a seastead by it, then all of a sudden you have this huge tourist attraction where people can stay, uh, right? These awesome coral reefs and, um, and you have, you know, water sports that support that and things like that. So I can, I can see a number of paths forward as far as having, you know, permanent full-time seasteaders. Obviously there's Airbnbs and opening up for rentals and timeshares and all those sorts of things. But, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to let the market decide that and create something that's as flexible as possible for as many different, uh, applications as possible. Okay. I was just curious. I just know that there's, you know, um, for any organization, even for each little community of, of seasteaders, there needs to be like, like some people that are there for at least the set, like I, I probably at least five years, you know, in order for something to get established, there would need to be somebody who really knows what they're doing to stay on for a significant amount of time. And if there's too high of a turnover, so I just wondering if, there's um, specific plans in place for commitments for those kind of things. Um, again, I, I, I think that we want to leave that up to individual groups and uh, businesses and, and things like that. Like uh, I think that would be handled with, uh, let's say, through Atlas Island and what they've talked about um, of forming communities and uh, how they would organize those and what level of commitment and things like that. So I, I would rather sell to a group that uh, has already kind of come together to create or, or have a desire to create a, a, a community that has a common mindset or a common vision or, or whatever they're trying to do. Um, and I'm, I'm viewing myself in Arctide as more of a manufacturer that can supply these to uh, a wide range of different uh, potential uses and types of groups of people and things like that. Okay, so then so, but my question is like to protect your brand, like you don't want to just sell it to a group that clearly doesn't have a plan, right? Like, because right. If, if something goes wrong and something goes bad or sideways, right, it reflects on the brand and it might, you know, right. power the market if there's yeah. anything. I, I honestly think business is going to be the first. I think uh, tourism and aquaculture are probably going to be the first targets. So I, okay. I'm... You know, I'm happy to talk to any existing group that has 10, 20, 30 people that are interested in some kind of uh, situation where they buy it together and they each own units and that sort of thing, or we sell off individual units. Um, but I honestly think that business is going to be the most scalable and, uh, and immediately uh, provide people who will be working there and will be living there long term. Awesome. Thank you. Andre, did you want to ask your question? question about uh, the same question about blockchain and cryptocurrency how do you think if it's going to be possible to realize any flow of the project in the future well the governments will put cbdc cbdc will not allow us even to collect money it will burn like every month if you don't use it what is your ideas how it is going to be possible to realize any project in the current future uh, it broke up a lot in there. Uh, I know it was government related and what government's allowing seasteading? 
related to blockchain technology. Oh, oh governments allowing blockchain yeah. technology to be on these sites? Oh, okay. yeah. I mean, again, going along with the business startup and things, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I love the long term future. I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing now in, in light of what I view humanity doing a hundred years from now as these debtors and things like that. But, you know, my primary goal is the energy, food, better way of life, better for nature, um, and whatnot that's in Puerto Rico waters or out, uh, outside of an EC. Like, I think that'll naturally happen as different groups and business ideas come together and things. But, um, I think that we certainly are very, very interested in blockchain. We've done a fair amount of work on that. Um, and we want, everything to be blockchain based off of these, uh, um, communities. Um, as far as I, so CBDC is, uh, related to central banks tracking your money and stuff like that. Right. Um, so a lot of that stuff, it just depends on whose waters you're in at the start. And, um, I don't know, I, I am extremely, uh, optimistic about the future and see a tremendous amount of abundance in the future. So, Things like that, yeah, different countries will go up and down and their uh, quality of life, I suppose. Um, but I just, just and start building something that can be used uh, anywhere, uh, really. That's not a, a hurricane zone, exactly. Um, I think people will figure out. Like I, 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 <clears throat> I guess that was something I realized early on is that we're probably not going to figure out all the blockchain solutions. We're not going to figure out all the aquaculture solutions, all the environmental solutions. We can create the platform and then invite other people to come in and create those solutions or let's create those solutions. So, um, so I'd love to hear from people that, that uh, are interested. I mean, the blockchain side of it, absolutely insurance and mortgages and rent, and all those sorts of things uh, we are extremely interested in. Um, but but first we have to get something in the water. That's I'm hyper-focused on building stuff in the water and solving that problem and then bringing other people in to solve the related problems around it. Yeah. Can I, can I ask we can, uh, we can find the better places without any hurricanes, but uh, such problems, such uh, projects like assistance will not be possible to monetize because people will have no money to buy it. We can we can discuss about hurricanes, deep deep waters, forever constructions, but it will be not possible to monetize with a CBDC because people will have no buy it because it's gonna be tracked, banned, whatever. Yeah, I I just I think that even just looking at something like aquaculture, the fact that China is sending massive fleets to Peruvian coast to take their business, everything in uh, Asian kind of surrounding waters has been overfished and that's a $160 billion, I think it is market um, just in seafood. So I think that there's enormous business investment opportunity and it's, you know, again, I, I don't know that it's going to start with a collection of individuals that want to realize a dream of living on seasteads. I think it's more likely it's, that's possible, but I think it's more likely that it's going to start uh, through business investment and company town kind of situations. Uh, one other thing that I, uh, th there's a lot of different potentials, uh, I guess, situations in the future as far as how nations view seasteads. Um, I think, again, viewing it coming out of business and uh, better for environment, better for humans, long-term future, things like that. Um, I'm, those are my, those are, those are what I'm interested in. And, and I don't, I'm, I guess I'm not, I don't really care that much about politics. Um, <laughs> Uh, I know some people do a lot, but um, I, I, I again think that we can build a platform and just allow people to do with it what they want and figure out the best ways to monetize it, the best ways to invest in it, the best ways to build a better future. Um, obviously, I'm not going to sell to a terrorist organization or something like that, but um, um, but I'm happy to sell to people who have differing views on uh, what they want to do there. Um, you know, as long as it's not hurting anyone. I think um, we can wrap up there. That's uh, an interesting, I mean, I think that's a, that's a question that's going to continue to um, be questions and answered in CSET and communities of 
of who to have in your community. Um, and I think it's a discussion we need to keep having. That's why we have this discord channel to begin with. So thank you so much, Ben, for joining our call today and, and talking about Arctide. Um, anyone who wants to continue the discussion can have that discussion in the Arctide channel. And um, if you want to talk about uh, just the community aspect of it, we have a governance channel. Um, and I love to see these conversations happening. I'm so glad we had a good turnout for both our conversations today. Um, and uh, everyone have a great Wednesday and we'll see you floating on the ocean. The Seasteading Today podcast is produced and hosted by Carly Jackson. Send feedback and questions to podcast at seasteading.org. To support our podcast and the Seasteading mission, go to seasteading.org slash donate. If you'd like to learn more, read Seasteading, How Floating Nations Will Restore the Environment, Enrich the Poor, Cure the Sick, and Liberate Humanity from Politicians.